Take your hymnals and turn to number 554, 554, Give Me Jesus. wonderful, endless life above. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to that portion of text we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. We're talking about the names of God, amazing group of names that God has given to himself, many of them focused around the two primary names, Yahweh or Jehovah and Elohim, many compounds of those names, many forms of those names that we find in the Word of God which describe not merely God in general, but the covenant God of Israel. And the covenant of God of Israel is clearly revealed to us in the New Testament as our Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at these names of God, we find them used of Jesus. We find them used throughout the New Testament to manifest his character. And they remind us of the great and precious promises that God has given to Israel in the Old Testament and to the church in the New Testament. Those are names that guarantee to us many of the promises of God which are yet future and which we look forward to with eagerness and with anticipation, not to be fulfilled figuratively or allegorically, 
but to be fulfilled literally, even as God has kept all of his promises in the Old Testament to his people Israel, so he will keep his promises to us as well. Now you recall that last week we were looking at the second part of the name Elohim. That's the name that reveals the omnipotent power of God, the God who is the creator, who can create out of nothing as we see that name being used in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. When he creates, he does not use up part of himself. He creates out of nothing. That's an incredible concept if you stop and think about it. God didn't start with preformed matter. God didn't have to use up part of himself so that he is less than he was prior to creation. He is an incredible God who can create out of nothing. And that is the picture that is given to us when we see that name being used, Elohim. We find that he is El Elohe Yisrael, that is God, the God of Israel. That name is used in its compound form to speak of him as the one who is the mighty God that keeps his promises, his covenant promises to Israel with his irresistible power. Those names combine to demonstrate that not only has he made his covenants, but he is capable of keeping his covenants. We saw the name Eloah also related to Elohim, which is the God who gives life in contrast to false gods and false idols. We used it, saw that the name El is used in over 80 different personal names and place names in the Bible because parents wanted to identify their children with this one who is the great creator God. Names like Elijah, Eliezer, Elhanan, Eliav, Elimelech, Elisha, all of those have meaning and they tie the name of God to something that the parents, as they gave that name to their child, wanted to magnify about the God who had given them the child. We saw that sometimes the name of God, El, is found at the end of the name, such as the names Nathaniel or Samuel. We saw that just giving a name does not necessarily mean that the child or those who gave him the name will be living in harmony with the character of God because the greatest number of names that we find in the scripture that combine one of the names of God with some of his attributes were given during the period of the judges. And that was a period of great apostasy. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes, according to Judges 21 25. But last week we spent most of our time looking at that name, Jehovah Savaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. It's not Jehovah, Jehovah Sabbath. That's a totally different word. This is the word that deals with armies. God as the God who is the warrior God, the one who is the Lord of all of the armies of heaven and in earth. It's used in the Old Testament 235 times. 235 times. This is the name by which God calls himself or he is called. And we saw last week that that name is a clear presentation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah of hosts is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah of the armies. Revelation 19.11 says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew himself but he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean. The word of God is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, the one who is leading the armies of heaven as they come back to earth to destroy those who have rebelled against him. We saw that the first time that that name was found in scripture was at the conception of Samuel. It was a warning passage because those who were responsible for God's people were abusing their authority and so the Lord of hosts was going to raise up a new priest, one who would take the place of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. The Lord of hosts was going to come and judge his people. And he was going to give them a faithful priest. He was going to give them Samuel, who would be the last of the judges, the one who would be the high priest, 
but the one who would also make way for the entrance of the monarchy, the one who would anoint the first king, would anoint Saul, and then when God rejected Saul, would be the one who anointed King David, and the Lord of hosts was with David. It's a magnificent picture. We find that name given first time at a transition whereby the kingdom is going to be set up and whereby a faithful king will ultimately be anointed by Samuel and from whom the Messiah will come, the one who is the Lord of hosts. Amazing context to find the first use of that name. We find that name again when Hannah vowed to give Samuel to the Lord as a Nazarite. We saw that that was the name that David calls God when he does battle with Goliath the Philistine. We saw that that is the name which God is called as the one dwelling between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. We saw that that name, Jehovah of hosts, Lord of hosts, reveals the character of God that guaranteed that David would have military success. And we, we looked at all these verses last week. This is the name that guarantees that the Davidic covenant will be established forever. We saw that in 1 Chronicles 17. We saw that that was the name by which God was called in the beautiful Psalms of Ascension when the Jews would go up to Jerusalem for the three required feasts every year. In Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. The King of Glory, we know who that is. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabaoth. He is the King of glory, Selah. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of glory. That was understood by George Frederick Handel as he wrote Handel's Messiah and set to music that magnificent passage, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Ah, people, that is our God. That is our Lord. That is Jesus I want to continue that study on the Lord of hosts this week because we'll never get through 235 verses, but I want to give you just a few more pictures that that name gives to us as we think about Christ, the one who is the King of glory, the one who is the Lord of hosts. We find most of the times that the name is used, the Lord of hosts, are in four books of the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah... Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Malachi, which foreshadows the coming of John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Malachi. We find it in a few other contexts outside of those major prophetic books. One of those is in the confrontation with Ahab when Elijah confronted Ahab. And this is the name by which God is known in confronting evil. Very important. This is the name by which God is known in confronting evil. The Lord of armies. He is one who does not mess around with evil. He is one who will judge evil. He is one who will crush evil. And so... That is the way in which Elijah refers to him in 1 Kings 18.15. Elijah has been missing for three years and now he is found and Elijah says, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. I will show myself to Ahab. The Lord of hosts is about to confront evil. The Lord of hosts is about to call a contest on the mountain with the prophets of Baal. The Lord of hosts is about to define himself with fire from heaven that consumes the sacrifice. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. 
This is the name by which God delineates himself in the confrontation of evil. That name, the Lord of hosts, is also the name by which God is known in confronting compromise. Not only in confronting evil, but in confronting compromise. We find Elisha, the one who follows Elijah, speaks of God with this name. He is in a situation where Jehoshaphat, the Davidic king of Judah, has compromised and joined forces with the northern tribes of Israel to do battle. And God is not pleased with the compromise. And Elisha makes that known in 2 Kings chapter 3. Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. Same phrase used by Elijah. Surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. This is the name by which God is known when God's people compromise. The Lord of hosts before whom I stand, says Elisha. We'll see a little bit later that that is the way it is used in the New Testament. When God's people begin to compromise with the wickedness of the world. Yes, God stands against the evil of the world, but God also uses that name when he stands against his people who have compromised and committed sin and walked the way of the world. It is a serious name of God in the scripture. But we see it used in some beneficial ways as well. This title, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Jehovah Sabaoth, is used of God as the one who protects his people. It stands against the enemies, it stands against the compromisers, but for those who are walking in fellowship with him, it is the name that is used to describe him as our protector. Psalm 46, Psalm 84, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. To the chief musician upon Getit, a psalm of the sons of Korah, how amiable are thy tabernacles. Oh, think of that, the quiet beauty of the tabernacle. O oh, Lord of hosts. We see the infinite care two verses later of God, the Lord of hosts, as he cares even for the smallest of his creatures. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O oh, Lord of hosts, my king, and my God. God knows when even the sparrow falls. In fact, it does not fall without him. God is the protector of his people. The one who is the mighty warrior God will take care of you. There is no need to fear. We find this title also belongs to God as the judge. In Isaiah chapter 1 and chapter 2 we read, Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. It belongs to God as the judge. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. The Lord of hosts is the one who is the judge. Do you know that all judgment has been committed to the Son? That all judgment has been committed to Christ? Therefore the Son is the Lord of hosts. Jesus says so in John 5, 21 through 23. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. 
He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Jehovah Sabaoth, is the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord of hosts is the judge, and all judgment has been committed unto the Son. That title, Lord of hosts, also belongs to God in his holiness. Not only is he powerful, but he is the one who denies by his being that wicked philosophy of might makes right. There are those who are oppressors in this world and who have power, but they are evil and they are wicked. The title, the Lord of hosts, belongs to God in his holiness. One of the most beautiful passages in the Bible concerning the holiness of God is in Isaiah chapter 6. We find the seraphim gathered together, they're surrounding the throne, and they're crying out. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah falls before him in verse 5 and says, Woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is a powerful passage of scripture, people. The Lord of hosts, that is the title that belongs to God in his holiness. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and as the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. My eyes have seen the King, who is the King of glory, the Lord of hosts. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Jesus Christ. On his head were many crowns. Do you know that Jesus specifically is the one whom Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6 when the seraphim were surrounding the throne and when the one who was sitting on the throne was called the Lord of hosts? Did you know that this is referenced in the New Testament to Jesus Christ in the Gospels? This is the Gospel of John chapter 12, verse 39. We find the Lord Jesus Christ has presented himself as the Messiah. The Jews have rejected him because God has blinded their hearts. And in verse 39 through 41 it says, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. The subject of the passage is Jesus. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Verse 39 and 40 are a quotation of Isaiah 6. Let me give you that entire passage. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, that is Jesus, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. We're in the heavenly temple here. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen 
the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now here are the verses that are quoted there in John chapter 12, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, when they rejected him. He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. These things said Esaias, John tells us. And he spake of Jesus, when he saw his glory. That is the heavenly throne vision of Isaiah chapter 6 that is quoted by John in John 12. That, friends, is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the Lord of hosts. That title, the Lord of hosts, belongs to the messianic king, Jesus. We find it used in Isaiah 9:7. You know, verse 6, unto us a child is born, and so on. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace shall there be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I hope that when you read your Old Testament, that name begins to stand out to you because that is our Lord Jesus Christ. When you see that name, you see our Lord Jesus Christ as the heavenly king, as the one who will come to judge not only the world, but to judge his people as well. The Lord of hosts, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What do you think the zeal of the Lord of hosts is like? Is it like the petty way in which we sort of half-heartedly go about our business for him? Or is it a flaming zeal with fire and energy and power and absolute holiness and righteousness as he comes to judge? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Here's another beautiful one. That name, the Lord of hosts, belongs to God as the author of of the eternal plan, the eternal purposes, and the eternal decrees. Oh, how we love those doctrines. That is tied to the name, the Lord of hosts. Listen to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 24 and 27. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who can disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? The Lord of hosts is the God of the sovereign decrees of eternity. That title, the Lord of hosts, belongs to Jesus as the one who is called the Redeemer and the one who is called the first and the last. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 44, verse 7. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. 47 verse 4, as for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Do you have any question that this title belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the one who is the Redeemer. Jesus Christ is the one who is first and the last. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the Redeemer. 
1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who, that is of Jesus Christ, of God, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The Lord of hosts is your Redeemer. Jesus is our Redeemer. In whom, having redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the richness of his grace. But Jesus Christ is also the one who is the first and the last. Four times in the book of Revelation we find it, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And oh, how we are in the days of the church of Laodicea. In chapter 1, verse 17, we find it. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. That's the title that Isaiah gives to the Lord of hosts, the Lord, the King of Israel, in Isaiah 44, 6. Revelation 2, 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Who is that? Who is dead and is alive? That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the first and the last. Revelation 22, verse 13, we get near the end of the book of Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Dear people, all of Scripture points to Christ. Those of you who were with us a number of weeks ago in the evening service, when we were looking at Jesus in all the Scriptures, every book of the Bible points to Jesus Christ. The names of God point to Jesus Christ. The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Pre-incarnate, but still the second member of the Godhead. That is the one whom we worship. That is the one who took on human form and died in your place on Calvary's cross. Who bore your sins and shed his blood that you might have eternal life. Don't turn your back on him. Don't go to somebody else. Don't trust your own works or something else to save you. The one who is the Lord of hosts, the one before whom all the earth will bow, the one who is the judge of all things, for the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that is the one whom you must trust for your salvation. And no one else. Jesus is the Redeemer, and Jesus is the first and last. This name, the Lord of hosts, belongs to Jesus as the Creator. Isaiah 51.15 says, But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. For thy Maker, that is the one who made us, that is the one who is our Creator, is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God of Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the one who in John 1, 1 through 3, is spoken of as the word by whom all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. The Lord of hosts is his name that belongs to the God who created the heavens and the earth. We find that name, that exact name, the Lord of hosts, used twice, and only twice, in the New Testament. It's interesting that both usages of that name are in the context of judgment on God's people. Not merely judgment on the world, but judgment on God's people. You think, well, how serious can that be? Oh, it can be quite serious, because in both cases where it is used, and where God is talking about judgment on his own people, do you know what the illustration is that he uses? Now remember, judging his own people, but he uses an illustration of judgment that came on some very, 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 very wicked people. 
In both cases, he uses the illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah. That should make us pause in our soul. Only twice in the New Testament do we find the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Jehovah Sabaoth, used. Once in Paul's great epistle to the Romans, once in the practical book of James, which is reminding us to live holy and godly lives. Once in the context of the eternal decrees of the sovereign God who elected and who ordained as he wills. Once in the context of Christians learning to obey. The first text is in the book of Romans which is perhaps the greatest passage on election in Romans and the sovereignty of God. In fact, perhaps the greatest passage in the Bible on the election and sovereignty of God, Romans chapters 9 through 11. In Romans chapter 9, verse 29, Paul is quoting Isaiah once again. And he's reminding those who are among God's elect of the incredible mercy of God which we do not deserve. In verse 29 he says, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. That's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Paul takes that passage and putting it in the context of election shows us just how bad we were when God chose us and called us and regenerated us and put us onto the path of glory. What a warning that should be for any who sneer at the sovereignty of God. Surprisingly, the second passage deals with dishonest practices of Christian employers. That's James. Practical Christianity. That's what the book of James is dealing with. We find the second place where the name the Lord of hosts is used is where James deals with the dishonest practices of Christian employers who do not pay their employees. And James tells us that the Lord of hosts is the one who will judge his people. James 5 verse 4. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. I hope you've gotten an idea of who the Lord of Sabaoth is as we've looked at those few passages in the Old Testament. Both Paul and James are drawing on the wealth of 235 passages in which Jesus Christ is described as the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies in the Old Testament. And they're distilling it for us in the context of the mighty doctrines of election and predestination and the sovereignty of God and in the context of how we as Christians are supposed to live if we understand who is the Lord of Sabaoth. Dear people, do you remember the first place it occurred? It occurred in that opening warning passage telling us that Samuel is going to be born and that the priests of the Lord, Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, had abused the sacrifices of the Lord. 
and were committing adultery, the two sons, in the very tabernacle of God. God was about to judge his people. And that is the way we find it used in the very last reference with that name in the book of James. God's people involved in sin and someone crying out to him that he would judge those who have oppressed them. That whole passage is in the context of the return of Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. Go to now, ye rich men, and weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you. James is writing to believers. Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. He's writing to believing Jews, those who have trusted Christ, who are in the diaspora. In chapter 1, your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Think about your riches for a moment. Think about all the stuff that you have stockpiled. Your gold and silver is cankered. That is, it has cancer. And the rust of them, two metals that don't rust. But God says they're going to rust. The rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Your people were living in the last days. James goes on, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields. These are the verses we just read. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, kept back by fraud. Crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren. There's a word of encouragement to those who have suffered that loss. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. It's in the context of the return of Christ. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. Until he receive the early and latter rain, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Man, I sure hate to have to do this to benefit God's people. I sure hate to have to do this to be a benefit to a brother. I sure hate to have to do this. Grudge not one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Who did we just see was the judge? The Lord of Sabaoth is the judge. The Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the judge. And he stands at the door. He's about to enter the courtroom. Oh, as the judge enters the courtroom, all rise. The judge is about to make final judgments here. All those who are rich and hoard it for themselves, failing to pay those who have worked for them and earned it, are going to lose it all. The rich pretended that they did not have money to pay. That's the fraud. When they actually had squirreled it away in hidden bank accounts and well-cooked books. The Lord of hosts knows what you have and what you have done with it. Those verses and the few that I'm about to read you in closing were written to believers, not to unbelievers. Listen to these verses from the Psalms which are quoted in the New Testament. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Psalm 50, verse 4. Psalm 135, 14. For the Lord will judge his people and he will repent himself concerning his servants. 
Now we find it quoted in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10.30 For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 31. Are you serious about God? Are you serious with God? The Lord shall judge his people, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That was written to believers. And what is the name? by which that one is known, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. You will not be able to resist him or cover it up. Be sure you pay those who've earned it. We have just three illustrations and then I'm done. We find illustrations of the judgment to be meted out by the Lord of hosts given in other places in the New Testament, all of them point to Jesus Christ. We find them in the parables of Christ. Matthew 22, 7. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the king in this parable. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Those who would not listen to his servants, those who despised his servants, those who killed his servants while he was away. He'd gone into a far country to receive a kingdom for himself. He received it. And now he hears what has happened. And he sends his armies, the Lord of armies, and destroys those wicked men and burned up their city. We find judgment on Jerusalem, the Olivet Discourse, Luke 22, verse 21, verse 20. Jesus prophesied it. It happened, literally. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. We see at the second coming, Revelation 19, 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Rather interesting, because we've just been through the Christmas season. Those are the armies that made the announcement of his birth. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. But the day is coming when those who have rejected him will no longer experience his peace and his goodwill. They will see him as the one whose eyes are as a flame of fire and whose feet are as fine brass. And out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That is the one who is the Lord of hosts. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is our Lord, Jesus Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the power of your word. It is indeed a powerful word. It reminds us of who our Lord Jesus Christ is. It reminds us that he is the King of glory. It reminds us that he is the Lord of hosts. It reminds us that he is the one who is the ruler of Jerusalem. It reminds us that he alone is the one who through his mighty power will bring peace on this earth. Jesus, the Lord of hosts, the King of glory, in whose name we pray. Amen.